let's continue working on. Now, see, to be honest, I was looking at this. This is our title, Building Faith. I don't like this uh, because technically I'm not telling you how to build your faith. I'm telling you how to build you in faith. There's a subtle difference. I think it's um, is it Romans 12 tells you that he gives each of us a measure of faith. So basically, our faith comes from God. Quite often you'll hear this in the secular world, that when somebody says, I just don't have your faith, you're right. You got your faith. It came from God. You got it. God gave you it. Everybody was given a measure of faith. Every single person on this world has a measure of faith. And it's where you choose to place your faith, or what you choose to place your faith in, that's important. And there's ways, when I talk about building your faith, it's not building your faith in the sense that we're making, here, I got more faith, I got more faith, I got more faith. Your faith is perfect because it's a gift from God. And when any gift from God is given in perfection, it is kind of like um, living in faith and stopping any infection of your faith, stopping any interruption of your faith, stopping anything come against your faith. It's kind of this precious commodity that you have got that you have to protect. And when we talk about building it, we're really talking about building you in faith, making sure that you're protected. Isaiah 26 talks about your salvation being like walls around you. And it's kind of like that. You're making sure that you're still in that place, in that place where you've got faith in God. And we want to talk about this. I want to look sort of just at different things. I want to ask a question, first off. Is God all-powerful? Is God able to do all things? Yes. Can we as finite beings limit God? No. Yes, we can. Ah, thank you for just not falling into that. That made it easier. <laughs> turn to Psalms. <laughs> turn to the book of Psalm, uh, chapter 78. And I want to look at this because it's really important and it's missed. And it's missed with this idea that we talked about last week and we gave some time on last week, which is sovereignty of God. God is sovereign, but... It's kind of like, uh, I've said before, it's kind of like uh, God is the owner of a building and you're renting the building. God is sovereign, but he still needs your permission to enter into that building. He still needs your permission to do things on that building. Now that's not saying, oh, I'm not giving God permission, but that's really the way the world works. The people who are unsaved, the people who are walking the ways of the world, generally what they're doing is just not giving God permission to act in their life. When James says the, the prayers of a righteous man avail of much, it is literally that. It is the reason you pray is to allow God into the situation. Allow God, give him permission. That's what it is. Well, it says in Matthew 16, verse 18, it says that we have the power to loose what is in heaven on earth and to bind on earth what isn't in heaven. So in other words, we have the power to loose and bind. And that is prayer. And that is permission. In other words, we say, God, we give you access, permission to every area of our life. And this is the element that I want to talk about because you cannot limit God. I want to look at a couple of scriptures to show this. Psalm 78, I think I've got verse 41, uh, but I'm going to start from verse 37. For their heart was not steadfast with him. See, it's important to have your heart with God. Steadfastness, be focused on God, be determined to stay with God regardless of how much the boat is shaking or rocking. You don't jump overboard at the first sign of trouble, you stay with him. And then we go on. But he, being full of compassion, forgave their iniquity or their sin and did not destroy them. Yes, many a time he turned his anger away and did not stir up his wrath. For he remembered that they were flesh, a breath that passes away and does not come again. How often they provoked him. This is talking about in Israel in the wilderness and grieved him in the desert. Yes, again and again they tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. <coughs> See, God is all powerful, but God is a gentleman. Right? You could be an all powerful uh, being, you can be the all powerful being, God Himself. And if God himself has all the power to do everything, he still needs our permission to do it in our lives. And we miss this. And this is the idea of sovereignty. Now don't get me wrong, God is sovereign. God is able to do all things. But he won't let we, unless we give him permission and access into our lives to do so. And we miss this. And I believe, honestly, sovereignty is probably the biggest heresy. The way sovereignty is taught among the churches is the biggest heresy in Christendom. 
And the reason I believe this is because then if, if you say God is always on sovereign, then that means that everything that comes into your life that's not good, well, I came from God, so God must be testing me. Everything that comes into your life that is hurtful and bad, you then can appropriate to God. So we don't, God doesn't just get the good things, he gets the bad things. And we miss this. I want you to turn to the book of Ephesians. Did I give you this? Ephesians 3. Verse 20. Now if you know, your, if you know honestly, see anybody who's been in an evangelical Pentecostal church will know this scripture. Right? Now to him who is able, so he's able, he's, also, he's all able to do exceedingly abundantly. And that's the life that we're seeking, yes? Abundant life, abundant living, happiness and joy and peace in every area, restoration in every area, above all that we ask or think. So that's how able he is. We ask God for help. He gives us help plus something. I ask God for my marriage to be restored. I got my wife back who's infinitely better than she was before. And that's not don't take that out of context. Anybody who knows my testimony knows what I'm talking about. But look at this word. According to the power that works in us. According to the power that works in us. You see, basically, it's like a, it's like a hose. You turn the water pressure on, and the water pressure in certain houses would be higher than others, but imagine your water pressure is really high, and it's really coming in. But if you keep squeezing that hose, the water doesn't get out. Because you're not given access or permission for the water to flow. You have to let go and let it flow. Does that make sense to you? Because I'm just trying to lay a foundation for what I'm talking about. Here. I'm trying to explain to you that God is all able, but God is not going to interfere in your life or kick the door through and say, I'm going to fix that for you when you have it asked. That's the power of prayer. And it's also the power of declaration. We could be saying, yeah, God will fix this. God will fix my, my marriage. God will fix my relationship. God will fix my business. God will do all of this. But if we don't ask and we don't declare, we're missing it. We're not giving him any access because it's according to the power that works in us. If I were to turn to Chris right now and I say, Chris, I got a million pounds in the bank. That's not true. All right? I got a million pounds in the bank. I'm going to bless you out of that account. Now, does that mean I give him a million pounds? If I bless him out of the account, I could give him a pound. Yes? But if I bless him according to my account, that would mean that I give him the million pound. Do you get what I'm saying? So what we have to work on is what is in us. What is the, the faith in us? The according to the power. That should basically be according to your faith in you. That's how much God will work. He's exceedingly abundantly able to do all things. But it is according to the faith that you have. According to the faith that you have to appropriate the grace of which is set aside. I said this before, and this is what I'm going to do today is again, it's more like a Bible study, and I think it is needed at this stage because I think that there's fundamentals that people need to get hold of. There is teaching things that will change your life. There is the ability to walk by faith. Now, we all say that as Christians. We all say we walk by faith and not by sight. Yeah? Now, let me uh, look at a story. Turn to uh, 2 Kings. The book of 2 Kings, uh, chapter 7. Did I give you this? I just give you the... Yeah. Right, I'm going to give you the background of the story. 2 Kings... Chapter 7, what you've got in the background of this is Samaria is under siege. And there's a famine. And when we talk about famine, this is a bad, bad famine. Right? People were selling like camel dung for other people to eat. And they were selling it for an absolute fortune. So they were eating. Yeah. They were eating it for, sust for sustenance. There's also, just before this happens, there's two women 
And what happens is they're absolutely starving and they make it strike a deal between each other. We'll eat your baby today and we'll eat our, the other baby the next day. And then this big fight breaks out because they do eat the first baby and then the other one hides her baby. That's how bad and dire of a circumstance it was. Now I can say, maybe it's just me, but I've never been that dire. I've never been that dire. I've never been to the point that I want to eat a child. <clears throat> right? <laughs> Sorry, I'm thinking Austin Powers here. Anyway, it's just, but they've got this stage that it's so destitute. And then you go outside of the city gates. And there's four men sitting there. And these four men are lepers. So despite all the stuff that's happened, these men are still probably worse off. Because they can't, even if there is done to be sold for them to eat, they're not really invited to go close to grab it, to get to, to purchase it. Because nobody wants to go near leper. So they're really, really down. I could say their circumstances are as low as they could get. Now there were four leprous men at the entrance of the gate. And this is what struck me. See these words here? And they said to one another, why are we sitting here until we die? Why are we sitting here until we die? Let me explain it. Faith is a walk. Fear, which if we follow the law of faith according to Romans 3.27, fear is the inversion of faith and operates off the same legal system. So how faith works, fear works in the opposite way. Does that make sense? So if faith um, requires me to declare, fear requires me to declare. If faith requires me to meditate, fear requires me to meditate. And the meditation for fear is worry. So when we start worrying about something, we're magnet making uh, the fear magnified in our life, in our mind. And what you have here is these guys, I'm going to be caught in all of something, and through this you see a biblical principle. If faith enables you to walk, fear disables you. Faith enables, fear disables. And what it requires you to do is to sit here until we die. So these men have caught on to it. They've been filled with fear. The whole city's filled with fear. These guys are the worst of, of all of them. And they're sitting there. And then it's, it's just like a light bulb moment. And it goes off for them. Going, why are we sitting here until we die? In other words, why are we afraid to actually go and just walk and step out in faith and see if there's provision on down the road? You see, this is the way God works. He calls it a faith walk because your provision for every need that you have is there, but it is there in front of you. It is there as you walk. So if you're going to be paralyzed by fear, you cannot operate in faith. And the way in which Israel in Psalm 78 limits God is through fear. See, that's what I want to say. If you've got fear in your life, you will automatically limit God. You will automatically limit God. So your job, if you've got fear, is to eradicate the fear. Find the source of it, eradicate it. Now I'm not talking about just the feeling of fear. Because we know from 2 Timothy 1 verse 7, that fear is a spirit. So it will always be just constantly buzzing around you, trying to find a way to worm itself in. Trying to find a way to get itself into your head. And if it's trying to find a way to get itself into your head, it doesn't mean, I think it's Kenneth Hagin said, you cannot stop the birds circling your head, but you can stop them building a nest in your heart. So it's, those thoughts may come, Chris, come here a second. Those thoughts may come, just stand there for me and face that way. Just, just here. And those thoughts may come. So if you imagine, this is your spiritual walk in life. We'll try and take it, because I think you're big enough to get that in your eyes. The walk in your spiritual life. You could be walking along, you could be feeling great. And I was talking to someone yesterday, and it's kind of what we're hitting on in the night of light, is that they says they get a voice in their head. And the voice isn't like a, a schizophrenic voice, it's their voice. Just condemning them. Shit on this. You, you drove past that person in need. You're not good enough, you're not brave enough, you're not smart enough. And that voice... It's the constant thing to get you to stay completely still and to take a seat. That's the condemnation, thank you. That's the condemnation of the devil. Because the devil's constantly whispering. This is what Ephesians 6 tells you, the principalities and the parts of the earth. They are constantly speaking to you. What kind of dad are you? What kind of mom are you? 
Oh, you should have done this. You should feel guilty. And the Bible says there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, but we still go, oh, I feel really guilty. And religion has told us, guilt's a thing, guilt's a good thing, it's the Holy Spirit working on you. That's rubbish. Hands up who is born again. Hands up who's baptized in the Holy Spirit. And if you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, you cannot... You have to get hold of this word because that word is the, the sword of the spirit, right? And if that word is the sword of the spirit, you've got to operate by that because I've known so many churches that tell you, see that wee bit of guilt or that ding dong thing that you get in your head when you've done something wrong? That's the Holy Spirit convicting you. And they take it from John 16, but that's not true because the Holy Spirit didn't come to convict believers of their unrighteousness, but rather to establish their righteousness. So the Holy Spirit isn't there saying, yeah, I see what you did. Oh my goodness, you lost your temper, you done this, you done that. The Holy Spirit is there to remind you that you're the righteousness of God in Christ and to direct you in that walk. See, let me, I explained this before. If you're doing this walk of faith, it's very, very hard to do it without the Holy Spirit. That's why you see 90% of Christians fall away. Because you're trying, it's like trying to push a bike that has never had their, 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 the wheels greased or the chain oiled, and it just, it's very hard to move along. You need the Holy Spirit in your walk. And you need to eradicate your fear. These people, these four lepers, end up going to where, because the, the, the reason there was a famine is the whole of the uh, enemy's army had surrounded them. And was it like a blockade? And these four lepers decide, well, what's the worst that happens? If we walk into the enemy's camp and they strike us dead, yeah, it's no, we're no worse off than what was going to happen here. We're going to die anyway. So they step out in faith and they go to the enemy's camp, only to find that God before them had supplied the provision. He had caused confusion among the enemy, so much so that they thought that they heard noises and thought they were being attacked and they left everything and done a runner. So they left gold, silver, food, supplies, supplies, supplies. And these four lepers go in and they're like, oh, we have the jackpot. <clears throat> We've had the jackpot. We went from being broke to being millionaires. We went from being starving to having enough and more than enough. And it's then that then they go back and they tell everybody at the, in the city and the whole city rejoices because now they, they, they've not only just came through this trial, they've got the provision. But you imagine what would have happened if they had sat there and done it out. There would be more babies eating. There would be more hardship in that city. There would be more things going on. But sometimes it starts with a walk. It starts with maybe feeling the fear Feeling the spirit of fear and saying, I'm not listening to you, I'm doing it anyway. I'm doing it anyway. You see, there's so many people in here who have dreams, desires, aspirations, or things that they've been believing for. But what stopped you is that you're seated, spiritually seated, thinking, oh, I don't know if I can step out of the boat. What if I sink? What if I fail? What if I die? What if, I, what if something goes wrong? That's the paralyzing action of fear. But God didn't create you to operate in fear. They're two polarized opposites. You can't have faith and operate in faith and still live in fear. Because fear disables while faith enables. So if I believe in God, if I'm trying to walk forward for God, I gotta do it regardless of the circumstance. I gotta know that, okay, what's the worst that happens if I sink when I step out of the boat? Well, so the Bible tells us Jesus reaches down his hand and lifts him up, lifts Peter up out of the water. What's the worst that happens if I say, I'm go God has given me a business idea, I'm gonna go and do it? What's the worst that happens? We put far too much stock on the things that we have and the, the comfort that we live in and the lifestyle that we have, knowing that really the Bible tells us that if you're a born again believer and you pick up your cross and follow him daily, you're going to enter into persecution. 
People aren't going to like you. Things are going to come against you. And I'll hazard, a, I'll, I'll put a statement out here. If you think that you're walking with God, but you never have an obstacle, you never have persecution, you never have a problem, then I'd be, I put it out there that you're not walking with God. You're maybe walking with someone else. Romans 6, 6 verse 16 tells us that we are slaves to one or the other. We're either slaves to the enemy or we're slaves to God. And what that basically means, whoever we allow in our lives and whoever we allow to fill us is who we're following. So if you think that you're following God, but really you've had no obstacle, then you're missing it. Because if you're a born-again believer in this world, you will have trials, you will have obstacles, you will have persecution. But Jesus tells us, be of good cheer. So what he's basically saying there, if you're of good cheer, you'll not be sitting here going, oh, look at what came against me today. Oh, look at what happened to me. Oh, I just can't go on. I don't know what else. Do you know what? Problems coming through. That's a Northern Ireland thing, by the way, that problems come in threes. So uh, two bad things have happened to me over the last couple of weeks. I'm not getting up again. And we sit there. But Jesus tells us what to do. He tells us 365 times in the Bible not to be afraid, not to fear. But instead be of good cheer. For he overcame the world. And if we're of good cheer, that enables us to walk. That enables us to step out and go do the things that God has instructed us to do. Opposed to the circumstance that we see before us. I, um, I don't know if I've given you this. Turn to the Gospel of Mark. Did I give you Mark? No? Alright, it's just come to me. So, Mark chapter 6. And this is the story of the feeding of the 5,000. Um... <coughs> Yeah, this, this is important. You see, we have this theory in our head that when it says that we walk by faith and not by sight, that a Christian's walk is blind. It seems like a logical conclusion. We're walking by faith. We're not walking by sight. So a Christian walks blind. When Kelly says, I need my glasses to drive, I just tell her, I drive by faith, not by sight. <laughs> Don't get in the car with me. <laughs> but what I try to say is that it is not blind. Faith is not blind. I shared this in Bible study. 2 Kings 6, don't worry about the scripture. 2 Kings 6, there's a story in which Elisha is surrounded by the, 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 the uh, Sumerian army, all on the hillside. And he comes out of his wee hut with his servant. And <clears throat> just a, a multitude of the enemy in front of him. And the servant breaks it. Right? The servant has a panic attack and goes, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? And Elisha's response to that is to pray. And when he prays, he says, Lord, please open his eyes. And when the servant's, man, the servant's eyes are opened, he sees the heavenly host surrounding the enemy's army. And you see, Elijah said, greater is he who is with us than he who is in the world. There is more with us than there is in them. You see, faith is not blind. Faith is spiritual sight. We see spiritually, so we walk spiritually. We see spiritually, so we walk spiritually. Problems come. Affliction comes. Uh, health problems come. Financial problems come. Sickness comes. And we are automatically faced with a visual representation of the thing that was in front of us. We see the doctor's report. We see the bank statement. We see all those things come in front of us. And we react naturally to the things that we see. And it causes us to take a seat and be in fear. But instead, God tells us that our faith is a walk. And it is a spiritual walk. This servant was able to see the heavenly host and not let fear in his heart to, not, to disable him. Instead, he was enabled because his spiritual sight was opened. And because of that, he was able to walk and say, it doesn't matter what the, the bank statement says. It doesn't matter what uh, the, the relationship counselor says. It doesn't matter what they say. I walk by a spiritual sight. I see spiritually. I see spiritually. 
You know, people will tend to do things when they're feeling a certain way. So they'll tend to give into the offering basket when they're feeling good or when they're feeling rich or affluent. They will tend to step out for others when the feeling provokes them. But I said this a few weeks ago, feelings are not how we're ruled. We're ruled spiritually. Our walk is a spiritual walk. So basically, if I'm going to walk by the Spirit, I have to have the spiritual map in front of me. I have to have the spiritual map in front of me. And when I'm starving and, and things are going wrong, Jesus said that your man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that protrudes from the mouth of God. So in other words, when I'm starving and I think there's nothing in the fridge, when I don't have anything in my bank account, I don't go, oh, look at my circumstances. Instead, I go, Lord, you are my source, my provider. You provide every way for me, every access for me. In fact, you provide every need. You say, if I seek first your kingdom, then all the things that I need will be added on to me. So you know what? I may be hungry. The hunger pains may go in my stomach. I may feel like I need something. And I've been there. I've been in this position. And when I was in this position, it was actually Kelly and I were in this position. And we had stopped eating and just fed the kids because we didn't have enough money. It was God's word and the, the, the illogical way God's word works compared to the logical circumstance I see in front of me that we chose to act by. We chose to give away whatever came in. And honestly, that's illogical. You would naturally be going, I want to hold on to everything that comes in because that's my supply. But God says, no. If it doesn't meet your need, it is simply a seed. I like things that rhyme. If it doesn't meet your need, it is simply a seed. So if it's not meeting the need that I need, the, 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 I, the need that I need filled, then it's a seed for me to sow, and He will provide. And that was such an act of faith. That was such a test for us in the sense that we went through it, and fear set in, and I could have sat back and went, right, that little bit I have, that little bit I have, I'm going to sit back in fear and just hold on to it. But instead, we gave, and we kept giving, and we kept giving, and God provided, and provided, and provided. 30, 60, 100 fold. And it was proper provision. In Mark 6, this is what happens. The feeding of the 5,000. This little boy has a, a couple of fish suppers. Comes before Jesus and Jesus tests his disciples, says, well, you know, let's feed all these guys here. Um, oh, guy, uh, Lord, how are we going to feed them? There's too many. And then he does this thing, and he takes the, the, the fish and the bread, and he lifts them up, and it says in the, the Bible, it says uh, that he looks to heaven. And when he had taken the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven, blessed and broke the loaves, and he gave to his disciples to set before them, and the two fish he divided among them all. He looked up to heaven. That word in the Greek there is anablepo. It's Blepo means sight, and Anna means double sight. You see, he didn't go, I've only got two loaves and five fish. I've only got enough for me and a couple of my disciples. You know what, the rest of us can watch, they can just watch us eat. He didn't go, there's not enough here. He looked to where his provision was, and he says, whatever is not enough, if I bless it in the name of God, if I give it to God in a blessing, He creates, He shows me spiritually that in spiritual places, in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, Ephesians 1 3, is every spiritual blessing, every blessing. So all I do, I'm a level, I get double sight. I don't go, oh, is that it? I go, oh my goodness, look at what this word says I have. Look at what this word says I have. Do you know what? My God is richer than Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, and all those guys combined. So, if my father is that rich, then I'm that rich. So I don't care what my bank manager says, I'm a 
for 29. I have every probation that I need. So whenever a bill comes in and I go, oh no, naturally I don't know how to make it, the first thing that I do is I bless it. I say, God, I don't know how this is going to happen, but I can see with double sight that spiritually there's more provided for me than what I see physically. I see this. This is the, the, the faith walk that you see past what is in front of you and you see the provision behind it. You see past the natural to see the spiritual. I assure this, but I want to share this again. There is a degree in which I say this and people think I'm weird. Right? That's all right, you're all weird. But spiritual sight is so important. I'm not talking psychic nonsense. I'm talking spiritual sight is a way in which God operates because we operate by we are spirit, we have a soul, a mind, will, and emotions, and we have a body. Right? And if we are spirit first, who lives and who has a soul, a mind, will, and emotions, and live in a body, and we spend all our time looking with our, our physical eyes, then we're not really operating in the spiritual realm. Does that make sense to you? Because if I have a spirit first, I have to operate in the spiritual realm. In other words, everything that I see in the spiritual realm, which is provided for me on in the Logos word of the Bible, it is written down in ink for me to see. That's what I have. That's what is sitting for me spiritually. And if I can get grab hold of that, then it doesn't matter what I see physically because I'm not a body with a soul and a spirit. I am a spirit with a soul and I live in a body. That's what the scripture says. I am a spirit first. I am spirit man first. So if I'm spirit man first, I got to see spiritually. I love General Allenby, uh, 1917, World War One. It was the taking back of Jerusalem. And in the taking back of Jerusalem, General Allenby was born again Christian. Loved his Bible, studied his Bible. And he didn't want to fire a single shot against the Holy City. So the Ottoman Empire controlled all of Jerusalem. And because he didn't want to fire a single shot, he done a couple of things. He, he telegrammed back and asked the, the British government to have a week of national prayer, which they did. They had a week of national prayer. He also dropped prophecy from Isaiah, a little pamphlet of prophecy from Isaiah across the city. And when he came up on his horse to the gates of Jerusalem, being a god fair man, he got off his horse because he said, I'm not going to enter this city on the back of a horse, but my king entered it in the back of a donkey. But he found it big -headed. He took Jerusalem during World War I, the great war, the war that saw so many lives taken. He took it without firing a single shot. Because the Ottoman Empire, all the soldiers had dropped their weapons and ran. There's reports that I've read, and I, I, you can actually find these. There's reports of some of the, the enemy soldiers being captured. And when questioned, they were asked, why did you do, why did you just run? Why did you not fight? Why did you not fire a, a, a gunshot back? Why did you just run? And the reports that were given were that when they looked at the opposing army, they didn't just see the physical army. They saw an army in front of them with someone sitting on the back of a white horse, brandishing a sword, clothed in white, which Revelation describes Jesus Christ. And they saw that in front of them. And they thought, we can't take on this. We're going to run it. Do you understand what we have spiritually? The Bible tells us that we have ministering angels. So right now, there are ministering angels with you in this room where you are. But when you look physically, you see the back of Chris's head, the back of Emmanuel's head. You, you know, you're looking at someone physically, but it's acknowledging what is here spiritually. Philemon 1.6 tells us that we are to acknowledge all the things that we have in Christ in us. We're to acknowledge the spiritual provision. We're to acknowledge what is surrounding us. You are never ever alone. Ever. Can you get that? You're never ever alone. 
You never left. You never forsaken. God is always there. But he sees you when you're crying. This isn't something, by the way. I'm not going to break into this song. He sees you when you're crying. He sees you when you're down. He sees you when you're uplifted. Spiritually, you've got to learn to acknowledge the spiritual side of you and to acknowledge your spiritual side of you. Want to walk the spiritual walk of faith. It's not a blind walk. You're called to walk and be guided by the Spirit. For as many as are led by the Spirit, these are all the sons of God. This is how we're to move. This is how we're to walk. And I want to just ingrain that in you. That if you're walking today and the first thing out of your lips is your circumstance, your problem, or what you see going on, or maybe it's what so-and-so did, or what that person's writing about you, or what that person you heard or overheard saying, if that is what you're focusing on, then you may be a spirit being with a soul living in the body, but all you're doing is silencing the spirit, blinding the spirit, and operating in soul and body. And if you're supposed to be that spirit being, walking that spiritual walk, you've got to see past it. So the next time, I'm finishing, the next time someone has a pop at you, someone has a go at you, or you have a fallout with a colleague, or somebody says something hurtful to you, and you can't even think why they did it, don't look at the physical person in front of you. Look to the spirit behind the physical person. We do not war against flesh. Ephesians 6 tells us that. But against the principalities and powers of this earth. We do not war against the person who is saying, no, you can't do this, or you owe me this, or this is what I think of you, or this is what I'm saying about you. We do not war against them. We war in a spiritual realm. And the reason Christendom is so cemented and sitting down in fear is because we're not acknowledging that it's a spirit behind the individual, it's a spirit behind the problem, it's a spirit behind the voice in our head. We're not acknowledging it. Instead, we're only looking physical and then we're going, what do we do? Oh, please God, please help. And he said, hold on a minute. I prepared you for spiritual warfare. I showed your feet in peace. I gave you the breastplate of the righteousness. The helmet of salvation. I've given all this to you. I prepared you for that spiritual warfare. But if you're just constantly operating in the soul, the mind, the will, and the emotions, and trying to reason everything out, you're missing the point. So I want to say this, and we are finished. I want to say this, and then I'm going to pray. Whatever it is, whatever the issue is, whatever the problem is in your life, um, fear of the physical emotional or the circumstance that presents itself in front of you is what is holding you back in your faith walk so eradicate the fear and operate in the spiritual realize that he has provided every spiritual blessing every spiritual blessing you're not to walk blind you're to see spiritually. You're to see what is behind the person, what is behind the obstacle, what is behind the problem. It's not a fear.